So just before I try and fix this again, I'd like to um, thank Jim, who is coming here under a great deal of time pressure. Um, I will say in, in my other role, in my sort of corporate life, I've the privilege of seeing at first hand a lot of the commitment to Ernst & Young bring to the whole area of diversity and inclusion, um, because they are involved and they are active and they are taking a leadership role uh, to really is very praiseworthy. And I think this is just one example of many things that they are doing. Um, so I'll invite uh, Karen Rose up now. Uh, thanks very much, Maura, uh, Lord Mayor. Uh, guests, uh, colleagues, um, it's a great honour uh, to be asked to say a few words here today at the launch of this uh, innovative project. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate Nisha O'Meara on being elected Lord Mayor uh, in, in the City Council on Monday night. Um, he has set out a very dynamic uh, programme for, the, for his next year that could and w will, I think, transform the city. And I think, as you've heard already from the Lord Mayor, that he is including issues of diversity and equality in his programme, and, and, and that is fantastic. Uh, June is a, is a great month uh, for lesbians and gay men. It is the time of the Pride Festival of our celebration. June 1993 was when gay people were decriminalised on the basis of equality. And Ju June 2010 was when the Civil Partnership Act was passed unanimously uh, by the Doyle. And this Civil Partnership Act gives extensive new rights and responsibilities uh, to lesbian and gay couples, and in terms of tonight, uh, in, especially in terms of workplace and pensions and so on. Indeed, it uh, amends the Employment Equality Act uh, by, deleting, by de de deleting the ground of marital status and replacing it with the new ground of civil status, which means being single, married, separated, divorced, or civil partnered. So the Civil Partnership Act has significantly transformed the landscape of, of equality and diversity within the workplace and has significant implications for employer groups, for trade unions and for workers. The other reason that I'm delighted uh, to speak here tonight is because Glenn has, since its foundation in 1998, prioritised delivering progress in the area of employment. And Chris Robson is here with us tonight. He was a founder co-chair of Glen and has, has written about our campaigning in the late 1980s and in the early 90s that we spent as much time getting two words, that is sexual orientation, into the Unfair Dismissals Act as we did in, in achieving decriminalisation. And we successfully achieved that amendment to the Unfair D Dismissals Act in early 1993, so that at that time a dismissal on the grounds of sexual orientation was deemed automatically unfair and illegal. An interesting aspect of this particular progress was the support of the employers' organisations because uh, the employers' organisations at that particular time were opposed to any additional legislation in, term that would, uh, in the employment area. But they supported our proposal on the basis that it was a clarification and not an extension of the legislation. And I think that's an early example of the type of collaboration and cooperation that we're experiencing here tonight and generally between us as employees, as workers, the trade unions, in particular employers and employer organisations. However, I think it's a funny old world that there we were in, the, in early 1993, still criminalised, but we could not be dismissed for our jobs or we could not have hate speech used against us. But I think those contradictions are very useful. I prefer them than the opposite. The reason that we have prioritised employment is simple. It is critical to a person's income, to their quality of life, to their happiness, to their security, and to their sense of fulfilment. And it is where we spend eight hours a day, where we spend a huge portion of our life. So going back to the equality legislation, Glenn campaigned very strongly for that, that broad legislation too, and for bringing in the nine grounds that, that are protected under that legislation. So rather than having separate legislation and bodies to deal with race, to deal with gender, to deal with disability, you'd have one piece of legislation and one organisation that would tackle all of them. And behind that is the fundamental belief in Glen that issues of discrimination and equality are connected and that progress in one area opens up opportunities in other areas so that this particular advance tonight is, is great for lesbians and gay men, but it's great for everybody in the, wor in the workplace. Because what we're trying to do, as, uh, as the previous speaker set out, is to create, is to make it average and to be expected to be treated fairly in the workplace. What we're talking about is developing a culture of rights 
uh, and respect and equality for everyone in the workplace and including LGBT people. The equality legislation sets out to promote equality and not just to prohibit discrimination. And as a member of the board of the Equality, I can of the Equality Authority, I can say that we've always taken this promotional, uh, developmental, positive role very seriously, working collaboratively with employers, trade unions and NGOs. And I think this here tonight, what we're talking about, is, or we're launching, this is an, another example of that cross-sectoral <coughs> cooperation uh, to promote equality uh, and to achieve a more equal uh, workplace. And I suppose just in case that um, people were concerned that with the merger of the two bodies, uh, I was on the, the merger working group and in that report we, we, we identified the developmental, positive, promotional role of the Equality Authority as being a model of good practice that should be brought into the new merge body uh, and uh, Minister Shatter has accepted that and that is in the heads of the bill as published. So finally, uh, this project is about equality and diversity uh, within the company and, and that's what we, I suppose, what we call the good for business case. But there is a wider economic competitive case for promoting a culture of diversity and equality in society, in the country and in the city. Uh, companies that want and companies that need to deliver equality and diversity within their companies if they are to nurture, uh, attract and retain key scarce and high, highly mobile talent. They also need an open, tolerant and welcoming culture in the external environment, in the society and in the wider city. There is little point in having a fantastically equal uh, workplace if on leaving the building you are met by a wall of discrimination, prejudice and harassment. This was the theme of another uh, Equality Authority EU project carried out, this time by Dublin City Council and by Glen. It explored the global economic and competitive advantages for Dublin, which is one of the most globalised cities in the world, of these qualities of diversity and equality across a range of economic areas. And that is attracting and retaining key talent, attracting and retaining those key growth companies that we urgently need, uh, improving the conditions necessary for innovation and for uh, promoting entrepreneurship, uh, making Dublin a more attractive city for international students and making Dublin a more attractive city for international tourists. We have to compete with cities across the world and qualities such as openness, diversity and equality can be another key global competitive advantage for us. So, uh, to conclude, Maura, you'd be delighted. <laughs> um, there's a... Uh, a great, a great quote from mayor, uh, the Mayor of New York, uh, M Michael Bloomberg, and he says that the ability to attract people and talent is the single biggest predictor of a city's economic success. Thanks very much. <laughs>